Hi, Voices of Color community. This is Reverend Aganateka Swan, one of the leaders at uh, Voices of Color. Today's Mutuality Monday. A couple of years ago, Voices of Color leadership realized the need to address uh, the issue of mutuality and equality within the people of color community, even as we address the issue of equality and mutuality between non-white and white communities. It is out of that that we created our very first video attempt to discuss this, uh, the lies that divide. So if you go back a couple years on our um, page and look into our videos, look for that video, the lies that divide, that was uh, part of the initiative. This year, we're going to continue strengthening our people color communities by giving space and voice to addressing the issues that divide us as people of color so that we can expect a better result of the work that we do for racial and gender equality between non-white and white groups. So here. My video today is going to be addressing the problems of disunity. So in um, Matthew 12, 25, Jesus tells us that every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. I'll make that a little bit um, uh, clearer. Ruin, we'll be, we're going to be destroyed regardless of what the white community does against us if we don't address the need for unity among ourselves as people of color we're going to expect ruin there will be no success because even while the white community might be taking uh, responsibility and becoming more accountable in the ways they address they, they relate with us in the world and in the church and in the marketplace if we are not doing the same for how we see ourselves we can expect that our work for equality will be in vain. So at Voices of Color, we do not want to work in vain. It's one of the reasons we're trying to unite all our voices across all the platforms, all the intersections. Why we address the issue of uh, economic, we address the issue of social status, we classism, we address the issue of gender, whatever is happening out there in the world also affects us in our community and we need to know how to address it likewise this issue of racial uh, uh discrimination it has a place in our own communities in our own communities we typically uh, 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 operate from a place of tribalism so tribalism really does not give you the same thing the same in, uh, outcomes as racism it's not a power dynamic um racism is an issue of prejudice plus power and usually among us our tribes until we go to war like we have happening right now in Cameroon, as happened in Sudan, um, you typically don't have an issue of power. You just fuss against one another. So really the issue that affects us and creates the divisions that we want to address among ourselves in Voices of Color, as a people of color community, is how racism affects us and how we want to um, work against the, that, those influences. We want to address how to push back against the impacts of racism. We know that racism, you watch our video, we know that racism has taught us as people of color to look down on one another because we have believed the ways that white eyes have seen us and white minds have interpreted us. So what I wanna share today is just few points for us. I put together about seven points that I want us as people of color to start working with to help us push back and make sure we're not letting racism come in and split us further apart. The first thing I want us to learn to do as people of color is to identify, amplify, acknowledge, and appreciate the contributions that other people of color bring to the equality conversation. You don't have to agree with them. 
you don't have to be friends with them but any work that is being done by persons of color to give people of color a voice at the table to bring respect and honor to us as people of color to affirm our dignity in the world we need to support it because one person alone cannot win the struggle people of color are not a monolith we are various people groups diverse people groups but look the thing is that racism allowed the Europeans to pit themselves as one powerhouse against this multitude of ethnicities which are non-white and non-European. So if we are going to win this battle, it is very important that we learn to appreciate the way our various people groups are doing this work of equality in the world. We're not all gonna come at it with one approach, but we're all gonna be working for the same thing, amplify one another's bodies. Two, refuse to believe the, believe the lies. How do you do that? Distance yourself from the interpretation of non-white bodies, non-white cultures, non-white practices that are by white voices. I'm gonna say that boldly, distance yourself from them. As a woman who grew up in a country in Africa, I have been shocked by the far from real description of Africans that I have found from white persons, white groups, white academics, in the in these americas so we want to distance ourselves you want to learn if you hear something about a person of color culture and it comes from a white perspective a white voice i will tell you that first thing treat it with suspicion don't even bother to adopt it to repeat it while we might be far away from each other's cultures and each other's geographical spaces nevertheless we live in a world now that has been breached by the internet. People are crossing from one region into another. Make friends. The same way we are telling white people to get to know people of color, making friends, we as people of color, we, instead of believing something that was repeated by white people about us, cultivated by the church, about non-white bodies, the way they go and do mission is, Befriend somebody from that region that you think is a person of integrity and a person of honor. I say that because there's a caveat. There are persons of color that spread these stories as ways of exploiting this paternalistic approach that white communities have towards people of color communities. They know that because white persons look down on us and per white persons have this white savior complex, the need to come save non-white bodies, that white persons will give money to non-white persons in groups to develop or to say in the excuse of let we're developing you. So there are people who will exploit this um, uh, uh, a need to be a savior complex that exists in white persons and we have to therefore in trying to learn about one another we have to be very conscious about the kind of person of color that we go to to befriend to know them and when i say befriend i mean i really mean befriend don't go just asking questions that's not a way to know a person it's just like saying like what we have been talking about in the academic world that um testing is not the best way to know a person's level of intelligence you have to see the everyday way so in all the way in order for you to know people of color be willing to be friends go for the long haul is a cheap way of knowing people to say i'm just gonna ask questions a brief person how are you even gonna interpret the questions you're your, uh, the answers of the questions you're getting most people are gonna give you questions from a person what from some level of perspective you don't even know the perspective from which you they're giving it they're just one person out of an entire people group However, if you start to be intentional about befriending that person for the sake of the long haul building relationships, you're going to find out that you start to connect with the other persons of color in their lives. Soon you're going to connect with the co communities of color that they are connected with from which they come and you will start to have a richer understanding of their heritage. 
And that makes for a better understanding. So refuse to believe the lies by distancing yourself from the white um, uh, uh, interpretation of non-white bodies, cultures, um, notions, etc. Three, advocate for the inclusion of non-white cultures, uh, uh, practices, influences, intellect, and perspectives at all levels of life and, ex uh, and existences, social, religious, economic, academic, science, medical, agricultural, whatever. Go and make that argument. When you are in school, go to your professors. Ask them, parents, having your children learn, be involved, get into the PTA, want to learn about what's the curriculum, ask questions, why are things being taught from only one perspective, why is there no inclusion, become the kind of people who participate in the life of the community by contributing what your culture brings to the table and making an argument for it to be included in the influences that are being introduced to your children, to yourself at all levels of life. There are things about people of color cultures, practices that have been adopted by the West, but credit was never given to the people of color cultures from which these practices came. Practices of leadership, practices of economic development. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Four, partner with one another as people of color communities partner with one another you know we racism has taught us to look down on one another and also created this thing of ambition to be where the white person is we don't want to be where the white person is we want to be where god put us we just want to be respected for it because a lot of times where that person that white person is they probably got there in a way that afflicted your people so why do you want to go there Jesus told us that in this world, the model that we have received as, as a true humans is that we do not strive to lord it over one another. We should not strive to lord it over one another. So when you live in a system and we have a world culture in which people lord it over one another, why do you want to represent it? Why do you want to be like it? Why do you want to adopt it? No, what we want to learn how to do is take a stand and say, we are enough. We're good enough. Give us a space at the table to earn our due respect and dues without becoming like you. We're going to do it in our own way. Number five, be united. Be united in all white spaces. Hmm. You know, this question of unity, this issue of unity, it's not just for people of color groups. When you look at the message that Jesus left for the church, John 17, 20 to 23, the entire chapter of chapter 15 of John is an advocacy to under, for us to understand the importance and implications of being united. If we are going to be victorious, if we're going to model the kingdom of God, why, how God wants us to be be um, representatives and advocates for the will of God in the world. We have to learn to be united. And what does unity mean? We have to avoid competing in one another in white spaces as well as in non-white spaces. We have to be united in all white spaces. We have to be united by learning how to learn from or developing the, the culture and posture of learning from and including one another in everything we do. You know, as an African in America who came into this country, when I came into this country about 25 years ago, I experienced my first discrimination in a workspace. I was told that my hair like this cannot go into the workspace. It was unprofessional. Can you imagine? I lived my entire life, almost 30 years. I was a little girl. My hair has been braided since I was a little girl. Got pictures of my hair in braid. Went to college, braided my hair. Because that's how one of the ways that we care for African hair. And then to come and someone tell me, you know, your hair um, is actually does not meet the standard. Standard of where? Standard of whom? White people don't have my kind of hair. 
So why should I be the one dictating to me how my hair should be cared for? But that's what I experienced. Let me tell you how um, appreciating the role that my African-American siblings played in this journey of hair equality. I did not find the courage to carry my hair into workspace like this until my African-American siblings started to push for it until they started to um, lock their own hair to represent the ways that African hair really is. They didn't ask us. They just said, this is their heritage and they're going to, they're going to affirm it. And they did. And they started braiding their hair and they were pushing and they were making the arguments for it. And you know, slowly over time, I finally found the courage to walk away from creating professional hair that met the standards of white culture, which means my hair had to be permed and treated like as though it was white hair. But God did not give me white hair. Why would I want to be treat my hair like it was white hair? That's wrong. But I found the courage to start to respect my hair from the arguments of my African-American siblings. And today, I'm into my sixth year of representing my hair in its natural African state and treating it and caring for it the way I would do um, all blacks are used to doing on the continent. So partner with one another. Let's learn from one another. You see what I found in this journey of, of, of um, how racism has come between um, uh, a people of color. I found that Africans and African-Americans we have a lot in common, okay? Of course, we come from the same um, uh, gene pool, right? We have a lot in common, but we all contribute some level of uh, uh, affirmation to the story. We don't all have the same uh, uh, story. We don't all have the same approach. But when it's taken together, the story actually ends up benefiting both sides and i'm assuming that, that that is the same way for the asian community for the hispanic community for the native american community so we have to make space if that's the case if it is that your efforts end up helping to benefit me and my efforts end up helping to benefit you in some way it may just make sense that we should partner again that's a christian model this is what we have in first corinthians 12 and romans 12 that tell us that the gifts are never meant to operate individually. The gifts are meant to operate together. We have a, a, a one impact for the entire community. If we operate separately, if we divide our efforts, what's going to happen is that it will benefit one group of people of color, but then the other group will not benefit. And that's one way that we, the, the Matthew 12, 25, um, um, a warning that Jesus told us comes into play. That's how we end up ruining one another because we dividing against ourselves by refusing to acknowledge uh, uh, one another's contributions and therefore creating room for partnership among us, people of color. We got to do that. Um, the, the, the fifth thing that I want to bring out is we got to lose the fear of one another. In 1 John 4, 18, we are told that real love doesn't create room for fear. Think about all the ways that non-white bodies have been harmed, especially the brown. Us brown because we Africans are majorly different shades of brown. I do not know where they came up with calling us black, but you will find that there are very few African people or people of African descent who have actually black skin. So I do not know where that comes from. I'm an African, my skin is brown. So I will refer to myself as a brown person, but also put in mind that we live in a culture where people of African descent are termed black because that's what white people decided to term us. That's another problem with align white people define us. They define us according to their terms. We become stuck with it. The terms don't really describe us. They are far from who we are, but we become stuck with it. 
and we have to now fight to come outside of whatever characteristics they have given to those 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 terminologies that are not even real for us. So one of the things we have to do is lose the fear of one another. We have been told lies about one another that make us fear each other. We don't want to come near one another. We got to push away with those. And we have to push in with love. Because you know what? Love is what holds the whole body together. We got to learn to love one another. What does love mean? Go to 1 Corinthians 13 to look out for that. Number six, we have to deal with the weaknesses in and among us of discrimination. Again, like I started out with, there's a whole bunch, lot of discrimination among us. I want to talk about how we treat one another um, when it comes to classism, when it comes to gender uh, 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 equality, uh, uh, sexual orientation, um, education and profession. We have adopted so many wrong ways. Let's not put it all on, on, on white people. We, we got our own sin that we need to look at. And so we got to be dealing with ourselves as the people of God looking within and say, hey, this does not fit the model of what it become. It means to be truly human like Jesus. So kick it out. I don't care where the ideology came from. Kick it out. Treat one another like Jesus says we need to treat one one another. So the uh, uh, seventh thing I want to uh, uh, speak about. Develop our own communities from within, not from outside. So white people are so used to developing us from the outside. They have formed these theologies about us. They have formed these theories about us. They go and they craft models of how to fix us. Know how you can stop that? Work from within your community. Go and stay among your own people. Um, I, I want you all to go to my personal page. I'm going to take a swan page and dig up the Good Friday uh, devotion that I, I shared with us. I think it was um, earlier this year, um, either earlier this year. Yeah, I think so. Um, if you want to be like Jesus, live among the poor, the broken, the disenfranchised, because that's what Jesus did. There's a whole lot of economic and spiritual reasons attached to that. You cannot help a people that you are not in mutuality and solidarity with. You're going to be a savior, complex person, just like the white people are doing. White people don't live among us. They don't know us. They don't care to know us. They've heard things about us. They've, they've, they've built all these theories about us. They believe it. So when they come to us, they come to us with a mindset and a perspective. That is already set without even having actual, real, lived knowledge of us. And we do that to one another when we move out of our communities and distance ourselves. I don't care how good and bad your community is. If there's a house that you can buy there, buy it. Your gifts, like Jesus says, we're the salt of the earth, we're the light of the world. Your gift will help to develop that community. So go watch that my video of Good Friday um, and Reflections. And we have to stop within this idea of developing our communities. One of the things we have to stop doing is following the money trail. You see, following the money trail is that thing that white people have set for us that helps us to betray one another. We say it's all about us. It's all about the Benjamins. It's all about whatever you call that currency. It's all about our well-being. So we move out of our communities. We follow the money trail and we help the white community disenfranchise our communities because there is no money trail in our community to follow and our we then become um um a um, um, molded in this way of relating to our own communities in the way that the white folks relate to us but that will change if we choose to go home so here let me give you a little bit of my african um um experience and heritage culture. So I grew up in a multi-ethnic um, country, Nigeria. We have over 200 tribes in languages, and we have three major regions, north, south, uh, north, uh, east, and west, and then the south is a very small area. After colonization, because of the ways that the uh, headquarters for industries and offices were placed, people started moving from one region to the other for work, for school, for whatever. You go out. We don't have social uh, we don't have welfare services, but here is the way that the African mindset developed itself over the years. You go out to study. You come from a little village. You go out to study. You get all these skills. 
But when you're done, guess what? You come home. You take that knowledge and you come home and you develop your community and you develop your village. That's how development has occurred in many Nigerian communities. It was not the government paying for it. Now we lost that with a brain drain. If you're if you're my friend on Facebook, you have you have seen my post. I've told you all what the brain drain is. Many people in the in the in the in the West don't know about it, but there was a period over two decades when something called brain drain um, 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 fleeced Africa as a continent of all its professionals and what it did, the devastation that it left behind. Because something you have to understand about this idea of developing our communities from within is that when we run away from our communities and we go and follow the money trail in white communities, we're actually developing white communities for them. How did America become so developed? It wasn't a white man walk, working in his community. No, he went and brought non-white bodies to fix it for him. And then he sat back and got the profit. And then now they turn around and look down on our cultures, which were stripped of our manpower, stripped of our intellect by taking all those bodies and bringing them to America or the other colonial countries and developing them. Do you think, let me ask you a question. Do you think if all the countries in Africa came to white spaces and took them the way they took black bodies, and brown bodies in slavery and enslavement and took them and, and held them in plantations in African countries to work and develop those, those countries. Do you think African countries would not look like the West? So what are we talking about when we look down on our communities not even understanding the impact of racism? That it is racism that took our people from us and made uh, leave this 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 demolish communities behind. Why do we rush to go live in these white spaces? By our own power, and then we have nothing to give to our people but look down on them. You know, this brings me to the uh, a story of uh, in the Song of Solomon. I love that woman in the Song of Solomon, other than the fact that the book of Solomon is the most sexy book in the Bible. I love this about her. Let's let's hear what she's saying. The book of Solomon, chapter one, Song of Songs. She says in verse five, dark am I, yet lovely daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I had to neglect. Are you hearing that? Humans, all the humans took this woman, pushed her out in the sun. She was working for them, got darkened by the sun while working for them. Their vineyards got developed. Hers was neglected. That is what we do to one another. People of color, every single time we run out of our communities, we go buy houses in the, in the, in the more fancy neighborhoods. We go work for the developed companies and organizations. Rather than going into our communities and say, hey, who are those who are working? Because, you know, people of color, let me tell you, whatever that you have believed about one another, it is a lie. In the hood, there is great business enterprise. Yes, it might be sometimes misdirected, but to not see the business skills at work, how about we come in there and teach people how to get in access to the business in the world by using the skills they already have. Look at what happened in America now. The sale of marijuana has been legalized. Yet we still have our brothers and sisters from our communities in jail. How does that make sense? Wouldn't the initiative have to be, let's get them out of jail since it's now legalized. All those who have been thrown in jail for drug possession, drug use, drug whatever, get out. Let's give them some money. Let's then be the first to be set up to deal in this drug, which they already found out was a business. So look at that. Look at that. That's 
that's what we do. Many of us who look down on our brothers and sisters who were arrested for drug dealing, drug use, yes, we still go, we're all going to go subscribe and get prescription for that marijuana now. So we're going to grow the white man's pocket. See how many white people jump to buy shares in the MJ business. We're going to grow their pocket while our brothers and sisters are still in jail. That's what I'm talking about. You got to go back and develop those communities. You're going to go within. Go when you see our people suffering day and night. I'm telling you, something will happen in your heart that will give you the power to walk across, have conversations and find ways for their voices to come to the table and for them to have access because we got the skills to build our own community. We don't need white saviors. All right. When we do not work in our own communities, let me tell you also something that happens. We develop hatred. You know, you're living on the other side. You're living in the hood. Look at this ghetto person. You forget who created a ghetto. Black people didn't create a ghetto. Disenfranchisement created a ghetto. But here you are looking down on your sibling for being in a ghetto. No, you are a decent person. Let me tell you, if Jesus were here right now, Jesus would be born in the ghetto. Mm. And he would live there. He would not cross that line. Wherever the disenfranchised were, that's where Jesus would be. So you all need to start changing. You want to empower your communities. You need to go back to where you came from. You know, you turn that phrase that they keep telling us where you came from. Turn it around. I say, you know what? I'm going to go back to where I came from. And I'm going to show you what happens when I go back to where I came from. Because I'm going to take all this knowledge, all this skill, and I'm going to put it in my own community. And I'm going to stand along my own community people. We're going to fight and get access to the resources needed to develop our community. Did I tell you guys about one of my favorite black men leaders, the mayor of Aliquippa? That's what that man did, turn our community around. A graduate, college graduate who refused to leave, who refused to move out and said, this is my community. And put his step in, put his step in, made a, a demand. Give us what is ours. We don't have to leave to come live among you. Have you read about Aliquippa lately? Go look. In the past eight years, the story of that community has changed to become one of pride because one human being got the idea that the way to fix the brokenness in our communities is to stop running away from our communities. I have also appealed to many of our sports fans who have been supported by the communities. Then after you make it, you go buy businesses and establish businesses and buy big homes in all these other communities that give all the income, all the tax money to the very communities that disempower us. What you need to do, take that money. Do you know how cheap it will be for you? Our poor communities are giving all these big businesses that don't even invest in us. Tax breaks to build and establish in our communities. Why don't you do that? Why don't you take out your billion dollar from football and basketball and whatever and coming back in your own community and talk to the leadership and say, how much land can I get for this? Will you give me a tax break and create jobs for your own people? Go back home. Go back home. You're right here in, in, in America. Go back home. Go back and strengthen the community from within so that we can show that we are proud not just of who we are, but we're proud of the communities that raised us. Because you know one thing, as a people of color communities, we truly, it truly does take the village to raise our children. We have no choice because we don't have access. We don't have access to privilege. We don't have access to power. So of course, it's going to take each other loving each other to make it happen. But when you walk away, you break the chain of that love. When we now meet each other, there's the ghetto one and there's the bougie one. And there's the vision and we don't like ourselves and we don't trust ourselves. How about we all come back together and build our communities from within? So here's all. This is what I have for you all today. Uh, do me a favor. Um, we don't yet have um, a regular schedule for how we want to do mutuality Monday. It might be once a month. It might be twice a month. It might be 
you know, every week we don't know. But there's a whole lot of things to think about. And I want you to sit down. People of color, sit down. Whatever your people group is in the people of color spec uh, uh, um, uh, a spectrum, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, deal with it. The message is the same. Let's come together and build our communities. And together in unity, we will overthrow this scene of racial prejudice called racism that is against all non-white peoples and cultures. And that reminds me to remind us that to everything we do in this journey, just like we do in the work we do for Christ, add prayer to it. We can do it alone. If we're working in the will of God, we need to be asking God to affirm it in our lives and in our communities every day. And if we ask, we know that we have a God who wants to grant our requests. And if our requests match the will of God, which is to demonstrate that all humans are equally created in God's image, and all humans have equally been bestowed with the gift of God's love, equally participate in that love of God that has been bestowed upon us in the person, in life, death, sacrifice, resurrection, of his only son Jesus Christ God will answer our prayers so thank you share this make it a conversation point help us at Voku this is one way you can partner with us so before we went on break in the summer we talked to you all about how we're starting to need finances so um, connect with myself and Haley and start to see how you can support us fin financially our letters will be going out privately. If you want to be a person who supports the VOCU community, who supports the VOCU leadership so that we can do what we're doing, um, send us a, a DM so that we can put you on our mailing list and you can contribute and help support us. There's a reason that we need financial support from you. Every time people step up to speak out against discrimination, they receive a lot of backlash. Our jobs are put in jeopardy. Our places uh, uh, in the community are put in jeopardy. Um, uh, we need a way to be able to survive while bringing out the message. Number two, in bringing out the message, we need resources. So for example, think about it. We have been using our five loving two fish and praise the Lord, hallelujah, God been working with it. We use our phones, thank God for smartphones. but. There are still people, we could do a whole lot better. We could reach a whole uh, larger group of people if we had the right technology to do stuff. Um, we, we provide seminars, we've been providing them for free. People watch them, they use them to, to uh, jumpstart their own uh, projects, but we don't get paid for it. Imagine if we could actually market what we do be a resource so that our work is not in vain. Because you know what, even the gospel, the possible said, even those who work in the basketball business, they deserve their pay. It's work for us. And we need to be able to not only be affirmed, but be recompensed for the great work that we do. And when you affirm us, when you support us by financially um, assisting us, guess what's going to happen? Others in the world, you're creating access for them to hear our voices then the advocacy we're actually making for the people of color community actually starts to find ground formally in academic world, in the ecclesiastical world, in the theological world, in the economic world, in the art world, the science world. And you would know that it was your money that helped make this happen. So thank you. God bless you. And I'll leave you all with these words. Sherry, think about them implement them and think about partnering with us at Voices of Color Christians United. Thank you. God bless you.